Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm very honored to be here with you guys bright and early on your coast, not so early here. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I would like to start um, by taking you on a little tour of my uh, studio in Paris and uh, show you some pictures uh, of the place that I worked uh, from 2017 to 2018. I would walk through this Algerian market, which was right outside my studio. And I would smell the vegetables and, and see the beautiful forms in the market and I would buy whatever looked interesting and take it to my studio. And you can see, you know, these plants and beautiful vegetables kind of just dug up from their roots. Um, and I would take them inside this building called Le Son. Um, this is a government sponsored community art space uh, where artists could rent a, a part of the studio for five euros a day. You just take your things and set up anywhere in this space. And I would say good morning to Kevin at the front desk and exchange a few pleasantries in French. Uh, very few because my French was quite limited in the beginning. And then I would roll my big roller bag upstairs, spread out on uh, a table at, and, and uh, start to work. And I would work all day uh, making either drawings or paintings, uh, taking a short break for lunch, work in the afternoon. And I would end each day by stopping at the little cafe across the street, the Tabac, for a cup of espresso and some secondhand smoke, as is the case in all cafes in Paris. And I would jot down in my journals my reflections on the day's work, the ideas that I had thought about, the materials I was using, the books I wanted to read about in the future. And really, at that moment, take, taking stock of, of that day. And at that time, my cardiology practice in Philadelphia really seemed thousands of miles away, and, and indeed it was. So I will uh, give you a little bit of background on what led me to this, um, this studio space where I, I had the pleasure of working every day for a year. So back in 2017, my husband uh, sat me down on our beautiful front porch in the suburbs of Pennsylvania and said, hey, what do you think about yeah. moving to France? Uh, I remember this moment very vividly, uh, thinking seriously about what that meant for me. He was up for a sabbatical through his academic uh, uh, tenure, and I uh, didn't have the same option being a clinician. At that point, I was at the University of Pennsylvania. So I was thinking a lot about this. What, what would it look like to leave my job, take our kids, move across the ocean, to a tiny apartment we've never seen in a neighborhood we've never been in? What would it be like to be free from all the uh, layers of skin that I really felt like I had spent decades building as a physician? Uh, to just be myself without a job, to define me without family or friends nearby other than my immediate family. And I began thinking, you know, what would anchor me in that situation? Uh, how would I feel interacting with people in another language? How would that change my perspective? Remind me of my own upbringing in Iran and, uh, and make me think about the relationship between my artwork and my cardiology practice. So the questions were, were very strong and it was very scary to think about, you know, having to basically resign from a, a job that I loved with colleagues I respected and a wonderful panel of patients having practice in the area for 15 years or so. But I decided it was, I would really regret it one day if I looked back and said, you know, I could have lived in France, but instead I just stayed and worked in my job. <laughs> it didn't feel right. So I decided to go for it. And so I quit my job. And um, I'll, these are some of the pictures. I will come back to those. Um, I, and we packed up our suitcases and boarded the plane. And this is our first few moments in Paris. My kids sitting outside the apartment where we would be living with our suitcases. And that's basically uh, the beginning of this sabbatical year. So how did this happen? How did I end up here? So I'm going to take you back a, a few decades, a few more than I would like, <laughs> to my childhood. Um, so I grew up in Tehran, in Iran, in the late 1970s and early 80s, during a very tumultuous period, uh, which included a war with Iraq, uh, the toppling of the Shah, and the start of the Islamic Revolution. We had to cover our windows with tinfoil to keep the Iraqi bombers from seeing the lights in our rooms. And our evenings were routinely interrupted by flashes of light and sounds that came from nearby explosions. Um, Iran had the misfortune of being rocked by an internal war at the same time as it was losing lives on the front with Iraq. 
uh, as the Islamic Revolution unfolded in the early 1980s. When it became clear that the clerics, the Islamic clerics had a tight hold on the country, my family left Iran and we moved to the US. I decided to become an artist when I was in high school uh, and pursued dual degrees in art and biology at Swarthmore College. And I would spend my days kind of moving from the biology lab to the studio, from the chemistry, um, you know, a library back to the woods with my paint supplies. And I really remember these contrasts very vividly and especially during exam time I, I remember going into my studio and just feeling the release as I started to paint and kind of forget about all the organic chemistry equations that I would never learn uh, and it was a real respite um, but at the same time the science that I was studying was also a source of inspiration for, for the art I was making. I had a wonderful biology professor named Scott Gilbert and he's an embryologist who has worked a lot of, in the field of aesthetics and how it how embryology and the aesthetics of embryology is kind of a lesson for, for us in life. And he, he wrote, um, I quote from him, we believe that one can seriously discuss the aesthetics of the embryo much as one would discuss the aesthetics of an artist's creation. Terms such as symmetry, balance, pattern, rhythm, form, and integration are crucial in both disciplines and are used in similar fashions. Indeed, all of our knowledge of the cell is based on interpretations of visual abstractions. I really love that quote. I think it, it summarizes very nicely uh, his work and some of the work that your group is trying to do as well. So during medical school, I um, continued my study of art. I went to a school in Baltimore and, and uh, had the privilege of being near to the Maryland Institute of Art. So during the day, um, I was dissecting cadavers and then in the evenings I was drawing, you know, figures in the open studio sessions at MICA. Uh, I took some independent studies and did some painting coursework there as well. Uh, so this is a picture you can probably guess of a, the birth of a baby and I, this was a very controversial series that I did in, in these uh, classes with a bunch of art undergrads while I was a medical student. Uh, but I was really, really moved by the visual experience of birth and what that looked like and, and what that meant when you kind of contrast it to the creative process and making a blank piece of paper just alive with a new creation. So I made these drawings from some of the um, images that I had um, experienced while delivering babies on my med school rotation. Um, and, and this was a, a really exciting uh, period because I um, really got to have one foot in both, both academic worlds. So early on in my career, I was very fortunate to be able to work part time in my cardiology practice and uh, and also have my studio practice as well. So in recent years, um, I've been making ink drawings on paper that my family um, likes to refer to as khat khati, which basically tr directly translates to scribble scrabble to be very uh, creative here. So I these are the tools that I <laughs> Um, these are materials that are old, you know, very ancient Iranian bamboo uh, materials. Well, the materials aren't ancient, but the tradition is ancient. Um, these bamboo sticks are carved into um, these what uh, ink pens where you kind of uh, dip it into an ink uh, jar and uh, make drawings. And so um, I started early, uh, early on with carving out time every morning before my kids get, my kids get up at like 6.30 in the morning. So I, I really, the only time to work is five, five or 5.30 in the morning before they um, wake up. So I started early morning, um, this is years ago now, drawing these little um, ink drawings uh, borrowed from the technique of calligraphy. So my mother is a calligrapher. Um, and the, this is just an example of what calligraphy, this is real calligraphy, not the scribble scrabble that I do. Um, but this is kind of the inspiration for some of the work that I've been doing. So I would, I would practice these forms. I, I love the, the discipline, the measurements. You can see all the, the different ways that um, the form is repeated. Uh, and, and then I kind of would take that and let it all go and make my own work um, based on the materials and kind of the flow of the, the pen on the paper. 
Uh, and so this became a, a daily practice for me. And I started making them and I just literally tossed them aside um, under my desk, under the bed. I was working in my bedroom at the time. And one day my husband picked them up and he's like, what's all this? And then he looked at them and he said, you know, these are really interesting. Have you ever thought of making a series? And I, I said, not really, I'm just doing them because I like to do them. Um, so I kind of thought about what his feedback was a little bit and, and I started to look at them a little differently. Um, and I experimented with larger uh, materials, larger surfaces, and really this, these became um, the, really the core of the body of work that I've done for the last 10 years. Um, I've shown this work in local galleries and um, sold a number of pieces from this series. Um, so I, it was kind of with this background that I decided, okay, I really need to delve into, um, into this a little bit more. Um, and fully immerse myself in making these. And so I, with that in mind, agreed to this crazy idea of quitting my job and moving to France. And so we did that. And um, I, I gave my resignation and I took my notebooks and notebooks of ideas for my art and we, we all moved, uh, moved across the Atlantic. Um, what's interesting to me is that I, I was surprised to find uh, that during this time, what I was making uh, actually turned out to be reminiscent of some of the imagery I encountered in my cardiology practice. So by way of background, for those who don't look at angiograms, this is an angiogram, which is basically a dye contrast material injected into the artery of a person who comes in complaining of chest pain. And you can see on the right uh, of your screen, the fully opacified blood vessel, the blood, the, um, ink, the, Contrast material travels all the way through, opacifies everything, everything looks great. On the left, you see a narrowing. You see kind of halfway down the artery, there's an area where there's no blood flow. That's an area of, of occlusion or, or um, a lack of blood flow and the heart muscle around that dies as a person is said to have a heart attack. So these images to me really look very much like the calligraphic drawings I was just showing you. And um, I began to, completely unconsciously um, make these script again scribble scrabbles drawings mm -hmm. of her, um, without a lot of intention really and just kind of letting things unfold and for the again for those of you who look at angiograms you can see the the relationship um, of the linear forms to what I showed you in the angiogram so I find found it interesting that it, it really was that distance away from my practice that time you know the physical dislocation that brought me back to those images and helped me understand that yes they were also drawings and indeed a, a huge source of inspiration uh, so uh, you know now when I'm back I um, spend a lot of time working in the intensive care unit I keep little pieces of paper in my pocket and whenever I have time or if I you know at the end of my day we'll make little notes or drawings about either interesting patients or people who moved me or situations. And I, and I collect them and I just move them to the studio and make work from them or just show them as they are. Um, another example of the kinds of images that I find inspiring my work, this is a, a slide, an H&E slide of a blood vessel under a microscope that, of a person who's died of a heart attack. And it kind of looking through the different components or the anatomy of a plaque um, uh, of the area of the heart that is diseased that causes blood, blood um, clots and heart attacks. And uh, to me, these look again like drawings. And, um, and so I, you know, I made this image in France, not at all thinking about this image, uh, but in retrospect, and as I was really making this series, it became clear what the reference points are. So with that, I, I want to step back for a moment and talk a little bit about um, you know, that break from our routines and break from, from the traditional day-to-day -day and how do we create that. And, and I really would be interested in hearing from you guys uh, after I share a few of my thoughts, how you know, you've created this in your life or ways where you can think uh, that we can have many sabbaticals in our day-to-day in our -day life. So for me, I, I really think that, uh, uh, well, first, first to, to reflect on the meaning of the word, um, sabbatical really comes from the word Sabbath in multiple languages, the, the Greek originally, um, a, a day of rest after a period of work. Um, and uh, I think that this can be done on a large scale, like a year, or it can be done on a 
small scale, an hour a day or a week, a month. Uh, but for me, the important elements are really um, creating the time. So setting a time that's non-negotiable, that's non-interruptible with very little um, expectation. So this, for me, it's the morning before I wake with my, before my kids wake up, I wake up and have a routine of making my coffee, doing a little meditation, and then having an hour to either make work, read, draw, just stare out into space. And the goal is not to create a masterpiece at the end of these hours, but just to create the time and the mental space to kind of see where, where that goes. And I think that lack of expectation coupled with the practice of regular time is a, a key element of, of a sabbatical or a, or a Sabbath um, uh, in our days. Uh, the second element is space. So right now I have a studio in Maniunk where I use, but for years, decades, I used a corner of my bedroom. So it really doesn't matter where it is, how big it is, as long as you know I can set up and leave my stuff out and I don't have to spend time thinking about, okay, what do I, what was I working on? Oh, let me find it. Let me set it up. Let me clean it up. It's there. It's ready to go. Uh, and I just enter that space. Again, it can be literally a two by two cubicle on the side of my bedroom, but it, it's an association with that space and the ability to leave the work. Um, and then, you know, the, the other element for me is uh, setting parameters around this time. Again, it, obviously when it's a year away, that's easy to kind of know the parameters, but when it's during my regular life, uh, it's important to have rules for myself. So in that hour in the morning, I'm not allowed to check email. I don't, I'm not allowed to look at my phone. I'm not allowed to write, you know, think about work. It's not it's not time to catch up on things. It's just that is my time. And if I have nothing to do or no inspiration or no energy, then I'll just sit and, you know, read or do nothing. So it's, again, it's, it's the parameters and what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to just leave you with a quote from Pablo Picasso that, that says, um, you have to have an idea of what you're doing, but it should be vague. And I really think that's, that's the key is have an idea, but leave it vague enough for things to evolve as they are meant to evolve.